Number eight, pornography solutions. This one in particular is definitely inappropriate for children <laughs> to, uh, to watch. But um, what I want to look at is dehumanization, powerful chemical cocktail, which in other words is the neuroscience of how this all affects us. And then number three, tactics, strategic tactics for overcoming pornography. So first dehumanization and then what happens in our brains and then practical, biblically based ways of overcoming this. Perhaps the greatest reason God limited sex to marriage was to ensure it happened in a relational context within the bonds of a lifelong covenant to keep us from dehumanization. Dehumanization is when you look at someone as a thing rather than a, as a person or as subhuman rather than a human of equal value. That's what I mean by dehumanization. Obje objectifying someone. It's extremely dangerous. Dehumanization is, is absolutely horrible because it gives you, it's a way of giving yourself permission to treat a person like a thing or like an animal. And I want to show you some really disturbing examples of this because it's something that happens in human history. They're not sexual examples. <laughs> so you could just relax there. <laughs> yeah, darn. <laughs> But uh, th this of dehumanization, and then we'll, we'll come back to look at part of it. First of all, the European col colonists believed the natives in the Americas were inferior. And from Columbus's day, the first one onwards, they subjugated and enslaved the people in America because they thought they were less than equals. They would, thought they were subhuman. American whites dehumanized Africans when they kidnapped, kidnapped and enslaved them. In 1787, the U.S. Constitution passed the Three-Fifths Compromise, where slaves were counted as 60% human for the purposes of senators. This also happened in Australia in how they treated the Aborigines. So those are both cases of white on uh, other races. Here you have white on white where the Nazis dehumanized the Jews, calling them vermin and rats. Concentration camps, like this picture here, could not function if guards thought of these people as equals. You would never be able to treat them like animals if you thought they were humans of equal stature. Um, and you know, there was a lot of evolutionary thinking that went into that as well. Prisoners of war in Japan, such as this man pictured here, went through an incredible dehumanizing process where they were tortured and starved and shamed for surrendering and for opposing Japan. Uh, this also happened in Abu Ghraib by American soldiers, and it also happens in ISIS when they capture people as prisoners of war. The Hutus dehumanized the Tutsis in Rwanda back in the 1990s, calling them cockroaches and snakes. And today, we have human trafficking all around the world, especially in industrialized nations, where women are kidnapped or tricked and then kidnapped and brought to wealthy people who treat them as slaves. For Christians, we believe that God created us in the image of himself, the Imago Dei, the image of God. Because we believe that, even if somebody's taller, or shorter, or lighter, or darker, or smarter, or dumber, they bear that stamp, that image of value on them. As Christians, dehumanizing is always wrong for us. God doesn't do that, and you don't see anywhere in Scripture where that sort of thing is allowed for. Um, but I realized that was a bit grotesque, a little tour through Amer American atrocities, not American, but human atrocities. And it, and it was white on black. It was, um, you have black on black, you have white on white. You have it, every kind of combination of race has done this or um, something similar to it. Look at the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Jews where um, during the time of Pharaoh, they tried to wipe out all the male children in the time of Moses, right? 
Dehumanization is a major problem. And here's what it says. One study from 2012 concluded by Rudman and Mesher. The research demonstrates, and they basically interviewed a lot of sex offenders who are currently in jail to find out what their previous habits were before they got to jail. And they said the research de demonstrates that men who implicitly dehumanize women as either animals or objects are also likely to sexually victimize them. Porn star Tanya Burleson, formerly known as Jersey Jackson, said, Guys are punching you in the face. You get ripped. Your insides can come out of you. It's never ending. You're viewed as an object, not as a human with a spirit. People do drugs because they can't deal with the way they're being treated. And indeed, she's right. Drug use is incredibly high among people in the industry. Nearly 80% use marijuana, and half use ecstasy because they just can't handle the, the situation. Although the money is really good, so they, they, they feel like they have to come back. Um, and, that's, and that goes for men and women. Pornography is one of these rare battlegrounds where feminists and Bible-believing Christians find themselves as allies. <laughs> This is uh, one feminist, Lori Schrage. She writes, this is uh, from the Encyclopedia, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. She writes, pornography shapes both female and male sexual desire into victim abuser roles and represents predatory sexual behaviors as natural forms of sexual and gender expression. Pornography is therefore harmful to men who consume it as well as to women who have sexual contact with men on and off the screen. In McKinnon's words, pornography represents, quote, sex forced on real women so that it can be sold at a profit to be forced on other real women. Women's bodies trust and maimed and raped and made into things to be hurt and obtained and accessed, and this presented as the nature of women. The coercion that is visible and the coercion that has become invisible, this and more, both feminists about porno uh, bothers feminists about pornography. Pornography causes attitudes and behaviors of violence and discrimination that define the treatment and status of half of the population. As a Christian, I heartily agree with that statement, that what pornography does is the same thing as those atro atrocious pictures that I showed you. It turns a human into an object or into an animal. And, and, and therein lies the deepness of the, the evil of pornography. Um, so we have three issues here. One is where you objectify the person in the studio. The people who are actually acting it out, they're looking at each other as objects, not as individuals. They don't have a relationship with each other. That's what happens when you don't have a relationship with somebody and you're having sex with them. You treat them like an object or like a performance, naturally or unnaturally. Uh, number two, the person who's watching objectifies the person on the screen. And then number three, in real relationships later on, after you've consumed pornography due to mental conditioning, you objectify a real person in a real relationship. And so there are three ways that this causes dehumanization, at least. It's wrong to dehumanize. It's wrong to commodify. It's wrong to commercialize humans made in the image of God. That's not how we're supposed to relate to each other. Um, by now, hopefully, we can agree that porn is toxic, it's poisonous, it's bad for you. But it can be extremely difficult to quit. This is Mark Laser. I, I got this book from uh, Dr. Yukonis, who, um, the, not Dr. Yukonis, but Dr. Laser is a uh, sex addict counselor who, <laughs> well, maybe you do that too. <laughs> yeah, she probably does some of that. But he, he's uh, very well known for, in, his, in the field for uh, in particular, some of his, his books and research that he's done. And he explains very helpfully what sex does to the brain. And this is not from a negative perspective. This is just from a scientific description. This is not pornography. This is sex. Okay? It could be pornography, but it doesn't have to be. This is what he says. On the front end of the sexual response cycle is arousal or excitement. If the sex we're thinking about is exciting, which it almost always is, then adrenaline gets the body ready for sex. Breathing gets faster, and the heart pumps faster, giving parts of the body increased blood flow. In the brain, the adrenaline has an upper effect, 
And, of course, you've heard of adrenaline junkies, right? These people that are always pressing the limits. You know, they're not happy to bungee jump, they got to skydive. They're not happy to skydive, they got to base jump. You know, it's always pressing the limit to the next uh, farther um, possibility. The main drug involved in arousal or sexual pleasure is dopamine. This is the ultimate feel-good brain chemical. Other substances and some activities elevate dopamine, which is the favorite drug of many who don't even know its name. They are really dopamine junkies. That's probably where we get the term dope from. I don't know if that's true, but it uh, makes sense. Remember that even sexual fantasies can release this drug in the pleasure center of the brain. It is quite the high. Now look, adrenaline is natural. That's part of your body. Dopamine is natural. I'm not talking about injecting anything. This is, this is a drug your body releases when you're in the uh, sexual encounter. Sex involves touch. We either engage in touch with our spouse or ourselves in an act of masturbation. This releases another powerful sex drug, oxytocin. Nursing mothers are very familiar with this because it is the chemical that bonds a child to the mother during nursing. I would never have made that connection between sex and nursing, but it's the same chemical released. This drug gives us a feeling of well-being and connection. If children don't get touched enough, these children will stop growing and in extreme cases will even die. When we grow older, we still need human touch and therefore oxytocin. This drug is also a natural upper. Adrenaline, dopamine, oxytocin. Let's go for the, let's go for the fourth one. When sexual activity produces an orgasm, a whole other set of brain chemicals are produced in the pleasure center, the catecholamines. These drugs have been compared to heroin and produce a euphoria that is experienced right after sex. There is also a calming experience with these drugs that causes a person to come down from the pleasure cycle in a very pleasing way. The whole cycle takes us up, helps us feel connected, and then euphorically brings us back down. The memory center of the brain remembers all of this and wants to do it again and again. What a description, huh? What a fascinating description. You know what I love about this? And I do love this because this is God's design. All, all we just talked about there, that's the way God made your body. And within God's boundaries, you can see the, the logic of this, right? That God designed our bodies to create powerful bonds through sex. That's really cool. Within marriage, these powerful chemical processes unite the couple, making both want to return to the bedroom over and over. It strengthens and maintains the marriage as the marriage goes through ups and downs. You've got this bond, this physical bond that happens with the, all these chemicals um, to stabilize. It's like a covenant renewal, giving yourself to the other again. Pornography, however, removes the orgasm from sex. You're not actually having sex when you're watching pornography because you're the only one in the room, well, hopefully. Uh, there's probably other configurations I'm not even thinking of here. But... If it, the problem with pornography is it removes the orgasm from sex, it removes sex from intimacy, and it removes intimacy from marriage. It, it, it's taking everything out from those boundaries and it's cheapening it. It's reducing it. It's, it's making it into something less, not something better. And because of the chemicals, masturbating to pornography creates an artificial bond with someone who doesn't know us and trains our brains to return to this activity over and over. Now let's talk about overcoming pornography. Thankfully, we're not doomed. <laughs> there is hope that uh, many believers have conquered this soul-deforming behavior, and God will help us find a way out. I love this scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where it says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God is powerful enough to help us overcome this. We have to get our eyes off ourselves and onto God, just like David and Goliath. Goliath was a, was a big, scary warrior, wasn't he? And all the Israelites were terrified of him, and they all fled, and they hid, and they whispered, what are we going to do about Goliath? What can we do? And little David came up. You remember the story? And he said, 
1 Samuel 17, 26, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Here's David. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who does he think he is? David had a different perspective. Everyone else was looking at single combat against a giant. David is looking at, he's going to defy the armies of the living God? Who does he think he is? There's a change in perspective. And uh, when it comes to pornography, when it comes to any kind of sin that's a habit for us, that's pushing us around, that's dominating us, I think it's helpful to think of David and Goliath and say, look, if God's on our side, who can be against us, right? And so let's look at six tactics for kicking the habit. What do you say? Um, number one here in... Well, I just want to mention this. In 2005, my dad wrote a book called Change to Change. You guys have all probably heard of that book. I've got it here somewhere. I love to make fun of the title, but it is, it is rather brilliant. Um, and so the, the whole concept of this book is that if you want to see change in your life, you've got to do something differently. So let's say you're, uh, you're addicted to pornography or you're, you're stuck in the rut of using pornography how are you going to get out of that? Well, I can tell you this. Doing everything the same, you're not going to experience change, the big change. So the idea is you make these little changes, these daily routine changes, and then that big change will fall like a domino later on. And so number one, though, has to be making a decision. Because unless you've made a decision, you're just playing around. You, you might get off it a little bit, and then you get back on it later. You might cut down a little bit, but then you'll act out later. You have to make a decision until you, and this goes for any sin, until you genuinely commit to dealing with it, you will probably not get free. Number two, and that's what we call repentance, is making that decision to change. I decide by the, uh, what was that phrase from um, 1 Corinthians 6? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit of God. I decide to change. I mean, what can resist that? Right? <laughs> what can resist that? And then you have number two, prayer and fasting. This is a spiritual superpower. It knocks us out of our routines so that we seek God with an increased intensity. Every time you feel that hunger pain, whether you, whether you fast for a day, whether you fast for three days or you fast for a week, um, you know, just drink water because if you don't drink water, you will die. Uh, within three days, so, so I'm told. I've never tried that. <laughs> uh, and, and if you have a physical condition, check with your doctor to see what you can do for fasting. You can modify a fast so that it fits with what you're physically capable of. But the idea is that you, you, you knock yourself out of your normal routine. Uh, if, you're, if it's a fast day, it's different. You know why? You're not making breakfast. And if you're not a breakfast person, you know what? You're not making lunch. And if you don't eat breakfast or lunch normally, I bet you eat dinner. And you're not going to be eating that dinner. And when you're not eating that dinner, you're going to have extra time and you're going to have a pain in your belly. And that pain is going to say to you, feed me. Right? And then you're like, oh, I should, I should, I'm fasting. I can't feed you. Why am I, why am I torturing my, why am I fasting? Oh, yeah, I have this issue in my life that I'm dealing with, and I, and I, and I, and I feel like I'm up against a wall, and I can't, I can't break through. And then you spend time in prayer. So the fast reminds you, and it strengthens and intensifies that prayer so that you, and if you're anything like me, I get hungry all day long. It's not just at night uh, for dinner. And, and, and so that's prayer all day long, and that's intensity all day long, so that now you're, you're really knocking on heaven's door. You're asking, you're seeking, you're knocking. And look, God is, God, is, God is eager to answer those kinds of prayers. He is eager to. Um, and Jesus teaches us that we've got to be sure to fast to God and not for people, right? We're not fasting so that we can say later on, you know, Jim, I fasted for four days in a row. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, I fasted for five. And Bill's like, I did a month. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> right? That's not what the point is. The point is that it's done for God, that it's done in secret so that God can, um, can help us with our, with our struggle. Number three, fight the battle in your mind. This is Jesus, right? Jesus says, look, you want to you hear about adultery? I'll tell you about adultery. Don't look with lustful intent. Jesus changes it from the body to the mind in Matthew chapter 5. And so it is in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, where it says to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 
and also Romans 12 too. Renew your mind, right, so that we can discern the will of God. That's what we need to do. We need to fight. Look, if we can fight the battle in our mind before it turns into a full-fledged fantasy and all our dopamines are cascading in this chemical cocktail, if we can fight the, the battle right when it's starting in our mind, when it's still just a temptation and not this uh, full-blown snowball that ends with us acting out, we'll have a lot better chance, don't you think? So I think there's real wisdom in the words of Jesus and the, the apostle here that uh, we, need to, we need to grab those thoughts and make them captive to, to Christ um, and renew the mind. Uh, then number four, this is an important one, sabotage yourself. I get this right from Romans 13, 14. It says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires or its lusts. Right? The idea is that we make no provision. Look, if, if you can make it hard for yourself to access pornography, you'll have a better chance of not using it than if it's easy for you to access it, right? I mean, that's just logic, right? Um, make it hard for yourself to access it. Install a filter. They have all these things on the Internet now where you can, you can purchase, or they're probably free ones too, that you can get a filter for your browser on your computer, on your phone, on your tablet, whatever kind of device you have, there is a filter that some Christian has, has programmed that can help you to restrict access. And that, that can, you know, that's not the solution to all our problems, but it does create a barrier where we have to think twice about it. And sometimes that's all it takes, right? Just like think twice about that sin, and you're like, yeah, you know, it took me so long to, to crack through this barrier that the craving is gone, and I'm on to something else now. Uh, and so that that's, uh, can be very helpful. Don't make provision for the flesh. You can disable the Internet during certain hours, or you can get rid of it entirely at your home. Be like Greg Schubert. Don't have the Internet at home, and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and I, and I, I know other people that have done this that for a time said, look, I am powerless to defeat this pornography addiction. The only way I can handle it is if I just can't have the Internet at home, and they got rid of the Internet for a time. It doesn't mean it has to be for the rest of your life, but sometimes we have to detox. And, and like I said, there is a chemical reaction in your brain and if you can get off that, the, the uh, most up-to-date information I have on that is that 7 to 14 days, the, those chemicals will be flushed out, and, and you won't have that insane craving anymore. You might still have other issues that lead to that, whatever was underlying the, the pain underneath that was causing you to medicate with pornography, but the actual chemical dependency is going to 7 to 14 days. You know? um, and then number five here, get accountable. Find a brother or a sister, probably the same gender, I mean, come on, that you can trust and confess this sin to. Ask him or her to hold you accountable. That's James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for each other that you may be healed. It's important you find somebody you can trust, though. You don't want to just blab you know, your issues to anybody because then they'll blab it to anybody else, right? <clears throat> you want to find somebody that you can trust. And then what you do is you, you give them permission. You say, Sal, I want you to hold me accountable. I want you to bother me. I want you to come to me and say, Sean, how are you doing with this issue? Did you do it today? That's what, it, that's what an accountability partner is. And it's probably better to have more than just one of these kind of people in your, in your life if you're really dealing with something like pornography or sexual um, addiction of some other kind. And then you call him or her when you feel tempted. Before you, before you get to the point of doing it, you call it. Like, I'm feeling really, it's just like AA, it's just like NA, it's like any number of other kinds of issues that we, we struggle with. And we can't, you got you to you gotta make changes. You got you to institute some sort of difference in your life so that you can eventually overcome the great um, obstacle. And then uh, number six here is get some Christian counseling. Many times sexual addiction grows from the wounds we experience as children. A competent Christian counselor can work, help you work through issues and receive healing so that the medicine of pornography will no longer be necessary. A lot of times we have these wounds and we get triggered and then we just like go right to something. We don't even understand why. We're like, I hate doing this, but I, I have to. Well, no, you don't. God can heal you. But a lot of times 
You need somebody else that knows what they're talking about to help you work through it. And, and there, are, there are more severe forms of sexual addiction that you do need to see a professional about because they know how to handle it. Um, so when trying to, this is uh, on the last page there, when trying to stop a behavior, it often helps to incorporate new habits. If you are not already doing it, read the Bible daily. Right? So these six tactics here for kicking the habit, uh, and here we're talking specifically about pornography, these are all things that will help you, but... In addition to them, putting in new habits is also a good thing. So this is stopping an old habit, bringing in a new one. If you're not reading the Bible daily, read the Bible. You can look up verses on purity. There's a great uh, website. If you, if you type in Bible on purity, you'll get there. And uh, it's, it's openbible.com or .info, whatever it is. And it, and it will give you a list of just verses. No commentary, no opinions, just verses on that subject, and, 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 and you, will see, um, you will see a better chance of success every day if you have the day starting with God, and not just reading the Bible, but also in prayer. Um, I'll share my own story a little bit with pornography here. For example, when I struggle with pornography, meditating on how Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, motivated me to change. Uh, I'll just share a little bit of my own story. The, the time that I struggled with pornography the most um, was when I was attending RPI. I was going to engineering school, and they had something there called the intranet. Not internet, but intranet. And this, and this was a, a, like a web page. This was in the, in the days uh, when you plugged in for the internet. You didn't have wireless. You had to plug in. But when you plugged in, it was fast, let me tell you. And... Uh, what this web page did was it searched every computer that was plugged in on the campus for pornography. And it gave you a list of all of it, and then you could just download it to your computer for free. As many hours of pornography as you wanted for free instantly. Well, not instantly, but it, it took, you know, seconds or whatever. Um, and that was really, really hard to resist as, as a, a young 20-something-year-old. And so uh, I, I, I couldn't... I couldn't get through that. I really couldn't. Until this verse right here, Matthew 5, 8, got a hold of me. And I, and I say it intentionally that way, that the verse got a hold of me rather than I got a hold of it because it was, it was something spiritual. It wasn't just like I took my head and I was like, read that verse, Sean. No, it, it was like that verse just like said, hello, I'm embedding myself in your heart and it's going to take a lot to get me out. And that verse where it says, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God, messed with me. And, and it got me thinking. And, I, and, it, and it got me to a point eventually where I said, I really want to see God. And this verse is teaching me that the only ones who are seeing God now or will see God in the kingdom are those who have a pure heart. And I don't think purity is limited to sexuality, but it certainly includes pornography use. And this verse right here, it really got me motivated to a point where I wanted more to see God than I wanted the sexual rush of looking at pornography. And that, for me, was the breakthrough, where it was just like, I want that more than I want. The, I mean, this feels really good, but that's, that's like everything. To see God, I want to see God. I really want that. And for me, that was the breakthrough. I came to a place in my own soul where I wanted to see God and enjoy Him forever. And that was worth it to me to, like Jesus says, cut it off. Cut off the pornography. In addition um, to, to this, filling your time with serving God and His people is really helpful because especially being around godly people of the opposite sex because what pornography does is it, it twists our minds around to thinking of someone as two-dimensional, right? That the, the people, well, I mean, you're looking at a two-dimensional screen, so I, I guess that makes sense, right? But you're, you're looking at somebody as a character, not as a real person. You're not thinking to yourself, does this, does this uh, porn actress have herpes? Like almost everybody in the, in no, seriously, almost everybody in the industry is struggling with, with, with sexual transmitted diseases, especially herpes. Is she, is, she have, is she dealing with herpes in her life? Is she on drugs right now? in this film. Uh, when she goes home, is there a child there that has been without her, her mom all day? You know, 
you, you don't think of any of those thoughts. You're just like, oh, I just want to look at this, you know, as an object and then throw it away, make it disposable, right? But when you spend time with godly people, you realize that women aren't objects. Men aren't objects. We are three-dimensional creatures built for relationship, not using each other. And so I feel like serving God and serving His people can really help when uh, you're struggling in these areas. The more real interactions you have with actual people, the less likely you are to hold to skewed fantasies about the opposite sex. I wanted to close in Psalm 51. I don't have that in the notes, but uh, if you could just turn over to there with me. This is the incident where David had sinned with Bathsheba. And if you think about it, it's not exactly pornography, but it's pretty darn similar, right? Because what did David do? He was up on the rooftop, and he was looking over, and what did he see? And was Bathsheba fully dressed? And no, she was bathing, right? And so he, he, that's where he started. And what, what did he do with that? Did he say, oh, oh, poor girl, didn't realize my roof was taller than hers. She's out bathing. Oh, I can't believe I just looked up. Let me go back inside. Is that what he did? No. He, he probably looked for a while. And then later on, you know what he did? He thought about it. He dwelled on it, and then he sent some men over and said, oh, hey, I'm the king. I'll do whatever I want. Go get her. Go get her. Bring her over here. She's married, king. I don't care. Bring her over here. I'm the king. Right? And this sin tarnished one of the greatest men of the Old Testament. It brought him down. And you look at the rest of his life, it's full of suffering, especially in his own household with his sons, with his daughter who ends up getting raped, and all these other dysfunctions that follow after as consequences of this one heinous act. I'm not so focused on that when I, because there are consequences to sin. My focus is how did David ever get it right again? How did he ever get out of that? Right? And that's what Psalm 51 is, is where he's repenting before God, and he's saying, God, this is where I'm at. Take me. Uh, Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is the prayer we need to pray if we're in sexual sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. So long as we're in denial, we can never pray this. Number four, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Verse 7. This is the prayer of repentance here. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. You know, he wants to come back. Yes, he sinned. Yes, it was bad. It was really bad, but he's, he wants to come back, and God wants to take him back. That's the kind of God we serve, a God who forgives, a God who brings us back when we repent. But this is the heart we need to have. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins, blot out all my iniquities, create, this is the, the, the key part here, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's the prayer right there. We pray to God, we say, God, create within me a clean heart. So long as we are trying to clean the heart, it might help a little. <laughs> <coughs> but if God does it, He'll do it all the way through. He'll create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from Your presence and take not Your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit so that he can teach transgressors God's ways, so that he can testify, so that he can help others. <laughs> so I just want to close in prayer here. Father in heaven, we ask that you would be with us and guide us and that this sin is not something that is unbeatable. It might be a Goliath, but you are a God who is in charge of the army. And we know that you can defeat a Goliath of whatever size and whatever shape, because you are more powerful. You are the creator, the sustainer, and the almighty. We ask that you would help us to be honest with you with um, sexual sin or any other kind of sin that we struggle with and help us to draw near to you and experience your cleansing. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.